Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Emmy Lee. She's the author of a book and a podcast of the same name called Think Like a Vegan. Please welcome her to the show all the way from London. Nice to meet you. Hi, thank you so much for having me on, Chef AJ. It's really great to be here. Absolutely. Now, you, I don't detect a British accent, so what are you doing <laughs> <Yeah>. in London? <laughs> I moved here, oh gosh, more than 20 years ago for work. And uh, um, and and I've been here ever since, really. It was early 2000s. So where are you originally from? I grew up in Italy, and I also grew up in the U.S. on the East Coast in New Jersey. Wow. So I'm a bit of, I'm a bit of everything. And were you vegan in all three of those countries? No, sadly, no. As all vegans will say, I wish I had done it sooner. I went vegan here in the UK um, just um, around, just about 10 years ago, actually. Oh, so you're, you're what I call a nougan. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, it's been 45 years for me, and I can't imagine a life any other way. But I'd love to know your story of when, how, why. Absolutely. Um Gosh, I wish I could say 45 years too. Um, well, I went vegan. Uh, it was it was a funny thing. Um, I was going through uh, IVF treatment, and um, I'm sitting in the and I talk about this in the book as well. Um, I was sitting in the doctor's office, and they were always lovely and everything like that. But I just kept having this weird recurring image of sort of being in a butcher shop, kind of like being manhandled and prodded and all of that stuff. So, it, you know, I was like, well, this is, and I, you know, everybody's so nice. You know, it wasn't at all not a nice experience. But um, and so one morning I was running in a park nearby called Hampstead Heath. I was running and I just you know how you when you're running or exercising you just think of various things and I thought wait a second cows can't ex cows are cows are are uh, mammals like us they can't express milk unless there's been a live birth and that stopped me in my tracks right then and there and I said wait a second, here I am in all my human privilege sitting in a doctor's office um, making, you know, reproductive decisions. And yet as a feminist and as a, and as a woman, I'm taking babies away from females of other species. That's not acceptable. So that, that right there, it just stopped me in my tracks. And I was like, oh, that's it. I'm done. And I can't believe that it took me that long in my life to put those thoughts together. Well, hey, you know, you came to that uh, um, a realization better late than never, right? Precisely, precisely. You, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I, there are people that are vegetarian and not vegan, and I'd rather have people eat, not eat meat than, you know, I mean, what I'm trying to say is I'd rather have everybody be vegan, but if vegetarian is the best they can do, I, I'd rather have them do that than nothing. But I always found it curious because, if they're doing it for ethical reasons, it, it's the dairy cows and the chickens that are probably, you could argue, treated even worse than than a lot of cows, you know, that are are, are for meat. And so that that's I always found that just kind of interesting. Other, I, I know the dairy is probably the most addictive component, which is why people have so much trouble with it. But I like that you made the ethical connection. And if Linda Middlesworth is watching today, so does she, because <laughs> she's a big champion for animal rights. Yeah, it, I couldn't agree with you more. The, definitely, it, it's the ongoing and and continuous exploitation of of uh, of a cow, of a chicken for their reproductive um, products. Basically, their their products from their system that they wouldn't have if they weren't female. So, it's um, yeah, it's pretty staggering. But I think that there's a lot of that. There, are people just don't make the connection. So it's important you know, to, to just talk about that. That's why I'm very open about it. Right. Well, I think most people don't make the connection. And, and I think most people don't want to make the connection because then they might have to change what they're eating and what they're eating to them is delicious, or maybe it's addictive. And, you know, it, 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 <laughs> I think it's a very interesting conversation because it's, it's it, it, the ethics, I think sometimes is the hardest 
discussion to have with people. You know what I'm saying? It's like when Forks Over Knives came out, I saw an an, an uptick of more people going at least, you know, plant-based, which is t- to me not vegan than any other reason, because people were like, hey, there's something in it for me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, sure. Of course. It is because in a way, People then feel like they're being attacked personally, like I, me or you are saying, oh, you're a bad person. And it's like, well, was I a bad person the day before I became vegan? No, I wasn't a bad person. I just didn't make the the fair and just choice. Once I made the realizations, when, once I had, you know, the 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 moment of clarity, if you will, then then that's a different story. You 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 make the change. But ultimately, you know, we live in a non-vegan world. So we're not making a judgment on whether people are good or bad. That's a completely side issue. We're we're living in a world where using animals is the norm. So what we're offering is a different idea saying, hey, look, wait, you know the the essentials of basic fairness, right? So, you know we share so much in common with animals, like the most basic thing, our sentience. So there's no reason that we can't extend basic fairness to them too. And when you have the conversation like that, um, then it's always, uh, obviously it's up to the person to make a decision to whether they're going to change and whether they're not or not. You can't make somebody do something they don't want to do, but you can provide them with the information. You can provide them with the new ideas and and hopefully then they will make a change whenever they are ready to do that. Um, and I think being being plain about it, being plain spoken about it, I think is really important. And that's I always try to do that. That's sort of my my first um, my first instinct is to always be very plain about it. And it's like, well, this is what it is. You present it. You present the ideas and the facts and whatever other questions they might have and the answers to those. And then they have to take it from there. You know. Well, I find that many people, maybe most people, feel like it's just their right to eat animals. And, you know, I love the tagline of PETA, animals are not ours to eat, wear, and experiment on. But you talk to many people, people in my family, and they think, absolutely, it's our right. That's what they're here for. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that is part of a, a, a cultural heritage that, that we have inherited. Um, we, meaning as a people on this planet, um, we have inherited from a variety of places in uh, in our our cultures, whether it's a whether it's a misunderstanding or a misrepresentation of of uh, cultural, religious, or a variety of things, and well, and it's also what we are basically told every day. I mean, it is the norm. So it's difficult to say for someone to say, well, of course it's my right to do this because everyone else is doing it. Like literally, ninety nine point nine percent of the world. So. You know, it's a, it's very much a, okay. Let me break that down for you and and see how that doesn't have to be our only choice. It doesn't have to be the only way to live. Um, and I think I think s- saying that is is really important and really powerful. It, notwithstanding, people are still going to think the exact same thing, and they're still going to say, "Well, that's still my right." Well. People say that about a lot of things that aren't fair to other people and basic rights of other people. So it's it's all part of the social justice um, discussion that we have to keep having. And I think like for, for you and me, including animals in that social justice and fairness discussion is is really at the at the crux of it, you know. Absolutely. So tell us about your book, Think Like a Vegan. What's it about? What inspired you to write it? Where can people get it? Uh, well, uh, the book, we were inspired. Uh, it's uh, uh, written by myself and uh, my friend, Eva Carolambides, who is in uh, Canada. And we met uh, in California at uh, at Berkeley at a, a vegan summit, actually a vegan festival. And um, she used to organize a big vegan festival in North America. And um, so we got to talking after a, a couple of years of knowing one another. Um, because we always felt that people would come to us and say, hey, 
uh, you know, uh, how can I advocate better? Or what about this question? What about that question? How do I answer this? How do I answer that? And um, when I did a lot of advocacy through these festivals, uh, I sort of, uh, I, I was the answer person in the, there was a tent called, why should I go vegan with big question mark? And so I would just answer questions, whatever questions people had, I, I would answer them. So one day we were talking, I said, well, how can we make things easier? What can, how can we create a tool for, for vegans to advocate for veganism in a more um, comfortable way? And how can we also make that um, accessible to non-vegans so that they can understand what it is, where we're, we're coming from? And so we were thinking, went back and forth on a couple of ideas, and we came up with this idea of a workbook. And, and in fact, the final chapter of the book really is kind of a, a, of a workbook because it has a variety of scenarios, um, and they're all real scenarios, either things that I have heard, stories that people have told me, or questions that people have come up to me with. And um, and we offer, uh, we have these scenarios with names all changed, obviously, and then we offer some uh, some solutions to them or some ways to uh, tackle those particular scenarios. And then we said, okay, we can have a workbook, but then we need something something more substantive um, before the workbook comes up, so that people know where to draw from in terms of ideas and in terms of the basics. So that's what we did. Then we put to, started putting together um, each chapter, thinking about all the various things that that could build up to figuring out the best way to handle the various situations. And so the book really is a is a tool um, to have in in your vegan toolbox. And it's also very much a tool for non-vegans to understand the, from everything from the basics to uh, the politics of it, economics. Of course, we also touch on health and environment. And then you sort of put it all together um, and, and culminating in the various, um, in the various scenarios. I and the like book that. is available. Oh, go ahead. sorry, go on. I was going to say, I like what you, the word you said, your vegan toolbox. That's almost a, a great title for another book. <laughs> well, yeah, I have better write that down before I forget it because I will. But you're right. <laughs> yeah. That, but you, you really think that non vegans would buy the book? Non vegans have read the book um, uh, mm -hmm. and, and they have told me as much. Um, I have had, and there's actually a number of reviews actually from non non vegans, and um, it's it's very interesting. Um, of course, you have to have an interest, or you have to have someone in your life who's vegan, but you know, an interest in saying, well, okay, let me, hold on, let me see what they're what they're on about, and um, and the what what I, what I always hear back is how clearly everything is set out and and how much information they get and you know without any kind of um i mean we don't have any imagery in the book in terms of of uh, suffering or or exploitation but we do talk about the facts i mean the facts are the facts they're unpleasant but that's the reality of it um unpleasant uh, in quotes because it's a lot more than that um and and people really appreciate that. Non-vegans really appreciate it. So they, they, the, the conversation changes from one being like, oh, you're vegan, like you're from outer space to, oh, I see where you're coming from. Okay. I see where you're coming from. This is serious. I understand. You know, and the book is serious, but it's also, it has light moments. I mean, we, you know, it's not, um, you, you know, it's not, uh, uh, something that kind of hits you over the head or anything but it, and it also has moments of that are funny um and people appreciate the, that mix and then take the conversation more seriously whether they then go vegan that's always a different thing but to me planting the best possible seeds i can is really all i can do and Eva very much feels the same way. So, so, you know, you do the best you can, put it out there, make, make the argument as, uh, as cogent and as interesting as you can. And, and then off you go. Uh, well, 
you know, it can have, you can have follow-up books, think like a vegan, eat like a vegan, shop like a vegan. Yep. It, well, you know, this, the, the, it took us a long time to come up with the title, but then once we did, we're like, oh, this has lots of applications. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned you had that epiphany when you were going through fertility treatments uh, and that caused you to become vegan. What was your diet like before and how did you feel about animals before? Or did you even? Um, Oh, no, I did. I did. Um, And and we were vegetarian. Um, But and and then before that, I ate anything. I was I was non-vegan. I mean, I I kind of tend to see things like you're vegan or you're non-vegan, everything else. There's too many, there's too many labels and so on. So it's easier to just sort of say, well, vegan or non-vegan. I was definitely not vegan. Um, and I did have these uh these squishy ideas of like, oh, welfare and da-da-da and all of that. Um I quickly learned that that's that was nonsense. And uh um I, I mean, in terms of health wise, I've, I mean, I grew up near Naples in Italy, so we ate a very vegetable, lots of vegetables and, and lots of fresh fruits and lots of pulses and things like that in any event. And there's lots of already vegan food um, or vegan friendly food, however you want to call it, in Neapolitan cooking and in Southern I- Italian cooking in any event. Um, so I was healthy. Um, but I, it was, it was the ethical and mental connection of the facts and, and putting it all together and realizing that, that that was the critical thing that I was missing. Interesting. So your co-writer lived in Canada. How did you write a book with someone being in two different countries? You know, we were, we were Zoom generation before Zoom, I guess, um, we were fortunate that we got to see each other at least once a year for the festivals, but um, we would just use all the various technology that was available to us. So lots of Google Docs, uh, and then we would have conversations on the phone and video, um, you know, on whatever the different platforms like FaceTime, Skype, and WhatsApp, and all the various things that have come out in the last few years. And um, and and really that's how we did it. So it was it was done very much like how everybody's doing uh, uh, remote working now. <laughs> we did remote writing. Neat. I, so your uh, your co-author also a vegan, I assume. Yeah, 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 yeah. She is. That's great. So let's see if there's any questions in the chat, or I'm going to ask some more. Yeah, you have a podcast. It's the same name. So is the podcast basically the book, or what is the podcast like? So the podcast, um, it's um, it's slightly different. Well, it, it's similar to the book in terms of it being um, kind of essays that build in one idea, and then... Um, so there'll be like one little topic and then builds on that idea and which is very similar to how the chapters the the initial chapters of the book are are organized and i have a ver- a variety of guests on and they will talk about whatever uh, specific topic they want to talk about for 20 minutes or so and um i tend to not have a question and answer type thing i kind of um invite people on who are experts in their field and who are going to talk about a topic uh, surrounding veganism that maybe people haven't thought about before, or it's not something that's talked about terribly often. And, um, and they'll let them talk for 10, 20 minutes, whatever it is, or even 40 minutes, whatever, whatever they want to do. So I'll, I introduce the topic, uh, talk with the guest a little bit, and then the guest gives a sort of a mini lecture. There's a little bit of a break in between um, with some music, and, and then we come back, finish it up, and then I round it out. And some of the um, episodes I have presented entirely. So if I have an idea about, um, let's see, one of, one of, uh, you know, talking about, for example, um, things to think about when we're sharing, uh, when we're sharing graphic images of, of animals and so forth. And I talked about that a little bit, uh, but I've I've had on other guests who talk about their favorite vegan uh, 
or anti-vegan arguments or fallacies, you know, so, so, um, uh, so it can help people kind of uh, identify the, the faulty arguments and, and helps them in, in advocating and talking veganism with others. And um, so there's a, there's a variety of different topics that we hit. And it's um, the first season is, is eight episodes and I am now starting to work on season two. And uh, that will also be very interesting covering a variety of different topics. What do you like better, podcasting or writing? I can tell you, I, it's so hard to write, in my opinion. It's easier to talk. <laughs> it, it's, they're both a tremendous amount of work. They, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, both of them. And they both, because of the way it's structured, I still uh, write and research a lot. Um, so even for that, I don't, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough call. It's a tough call. I guess sometimes I'm more inspired to write and other times I'm more inspired to talk, but it's, uh, they're both a lot of work. <laughs> Was it hard to get a publisher for this type of book? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Oh. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So you, you mentioned graphic images. I, I don't think that's the best way to enroll people personally. Yeah, I, um, some people feel that they need to be seen and so forth. What, what I put forth as something to think about is there is no way for us to get consent from an animal to show them in their most humiliating, distressing, and awful moments of their life. We don't have that, cons we, we cannot get that consent. We cannot get that effective consent. So for me, we're also denying them a certain, we're, we're further denying them their autonomy. And I find that very difficult to, to I struggle with that as a, as a woman in particular, um, you know, to have, you don't have agency over the, the these moments in your life. And I think that's, um, for me, that's a, a really difficult thing. Um, and, and I know that people who share these images are doing so in their, it, they have the best of intentions. And some people really do need to see these things and be shocked into it. But I, I agree with you. I don't think it's, it's the best way um, because often people will say, well, can't we do it a nicer way? And you're like, how do you nicer way kill someone? Yeah, well, that, that's funny that you mentioned that because the question from the live viewer, Cindy, let me get it, is exactly about that. She said, how do you have a discussion with someone who says, I hunt and eat what I kill and those that eat, in quotes, humanely raised animals, and therefore they're not supporting, you know, large businesses that raise animals and CAFO and things like that? Um, it can be very difficult because sometimes these folks, they may not be actually interested in having a conversation with you about that. And if they're not interested, find someone else who is actually interested in talking to you. Having said that, if you have to engage in a conversation, what I always try to do is step it back and say, look, you know, the size of the business doesn't matter because, you know, 10,000 years ago when we started animal agriculture, it didn't matter if there were two cows or six sheep or 6,000. I mean, it's just a matter of numbers, right? That your death is death, whether it, it only happens once to each and every single one of us, including each and every single animal. But basically, how I approach it is from a fairness perspective. And I just say, well, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's really, um, we extend fairness um, to those of us who, you know, there's got to be a, um, a morally relevant reason to do something different to somebody else if, when it comes to their basic rights and to, their, the, to the fundamental basics. And life and death is a fundamental basic. And we don't, we take that very seriously. We take that very seriously in all situations. And animals are no different from us in the most very essential way. And that way is sentience. And sentience doesn't mean that they're cute or rare or, or 
endangered or super common or smart. Those are all things that are external to them, just like all of our differences, all of our human differences are just external and, and superficial. They're not, they're not fundamental differences. So what we have in common with them is our sentience, meaning we want to live that one more moment. And just like it's not fair to take and exploit a life of another, it's certainly that fairness extends to other animals. So when you look at it from a fairness perspective, um, I think that gives you a little bit more leverage, but it, it's very difficult when someone is very much convinced that that's what they want to do and that's what they're going to do. You may come across, you know, it, it's going to be a, uh, a very friction. There's going to be a lot of friction and there's going to be a lot of conflict. Well, yeah. But if they are... It, you talk about friction and conflict. We've got the holidays coming up now, and it's so yes. hard for people in mixed households. Sometimes they're the only vegan in their household, and they're going to Thanksgiving dinner with a yes. dead animal on them. It, it's really hard for people. It is very difficult. I think um, I think the most difficult moments are with families because of all the other dynamics that are there. And uh, the, the politics, the family politics and the family dynamics and, and so on. So those are really difficult situations. Um, and I've had both. I've had family who's like, oh, no, if you're coming over. That's fine. We will make everything vegan so we can all eat vegan. And um, and I've had family that that makes their food and makes vegan food. So it, it is very difficult, without a doubt. But at the end of the day, it's not as tough as what the animals have to go through. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's tough. It's tough and it's difficult for us. Yes, absolutely. But we get to live another day and we're not exploited for our bodies. How do you feel about people that vegans that are really pushy? Because there's one watching now. She's a dear friend of mine. And I feel like that that approach sometimes makes people not want to be vegan. You know, when you make them when you just don't let up on them and you make don't accept them and you make them feel bad. Well, I mean, it, I guess it just depends on, it depends on the person. Um, you know, I mean, I don't really, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, we can't really compromise in terms of, um, we can't say like, oh, well, that's okay, because it's not okay. But there's other ways of saying that, you know, um, and Sometimes people are going to get upset with you even just for existing as a vegan. Um, and doesn't matter what you say or don't say, or you think you're being completely fine and nice and they're still going to be upset with you. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I know that some people have, uh, have become vegan after talking with lots of pushy vegans or whatever. And some people know. It, it really depends on the person speaking it you know each of us has our own ways of uh of being an activist because i believe very much that each of us is an activist yeah, talk more about what you mean by that because a lot of people i feel like don't want anything to do with any kind of activism not just vegan activism but just in general they kind of want to maintain a low profile and fair enough absolutely fair enough uh, i think you know i um and i i talk about this in the book as well um Angela Davis said, I, I watched her uh, talk a few years ago uh, here in London, and, and she said, activism can be of any variety of things. And I'm paraphrasing. Um, not everybody wants to organize. So find whatever it is that you're good at and use that. Go to that first. And I very much see it as that as well. Um, I can write, I can put together a podcast, so I'm doing that. But that doesn't mean that other forms of, uh, of activism aren't activism. Even just existing as a vegan in a space where vegans may not necessarily exist, like your office or, or you know, your workplace, wherever. Lots of time just existing as a vegan, that's activism in itself. And sometimes that's all you can do or you feel comfortable doing. And and I think that's uh, I think that's also huge. Um, 
and I also understand, you know, not wanting to always feel like you are under scrutiny or in the spotlight and so forth. I, I totally get that. It's it's not easy. It's not easy. But just existence, just saying, oh, no, I'm going to have the vegan option. You know, or I'm having, a, you know, a cappuccino and a cappuccino has oat milk or soy milk or whatever. You're that's activism, too, because people are going to say, oh, what's in your oh, oh, you don't want milk. No, no, I want the soy milk, please. That's that's a moment of activism. Yeah. Is there, has there been any research done on what is the best way to help people go vegan? Nothing. There's lots of different things floating around out there, but there really is no way uh, to have, well, well, I should say there may very well be uh, uh, some, some long-term study that could possibly be done, but I don't think that we have that. And ultimately, you know, I don't think that there is one best way of anything. If you think about how people um, are influenced and change their minds uh, or learn about various topics and issues and politics and whatever it is, we undertake those kinds of activities in a variety of ways. And it, it's not when you're trying to change people's minds, there isn't one way because we we all operate slightly differently. Or you and I may operate in some way similar. We may be able to solve problems in a similar way, but then somebody else does it in a slightly different way. So I don't think that there's any way to say, oh, well, this works and that doesn't work. Because also, you know, what's the definition of it working and not working? Does somebody become vegan for a year and then they stop? Um, what is that? Is that successful or is that not successful? I would say that's not successful. It was successful for that year, but then how do we, how do we score that on the success scorecard? You know, if somebody is vegan until the moment they cease to exist, then that's a, is that a 10, you know, and somebody who's vegan for say a year, is that a one, you know? So I think that's a very difficult, uh, you know, we can't say, oh, this is the most effective. I think effectiveness comes from within. How comfortable are you talking about veganism? How comfortable are you being vegan in whatever situation? And I think that's the most successful thing. That's that's how you can gauge success, but only from yourself. I think a lot of people, it's hard because, you know, we historically we evolved in small groups, tribes, villages. And I think a lot of times if people don't have that family or community support, it's hard for them to be the only one, you know, and and that's why I think socially it makes it hard for a lot of people, especially people that are more like agreeable people pleasing, you know, that they care what other people think. I think one of the reasons I've been successful is I, you know, as a kid, like I would wear two different <laughs> shoes. I, I never, I said that I, I like when people criticize me, but I, I never cared all that much what people thought, unless they were people that I really thought were, you know, pe you know, people like just the average person. Cause you know, do it just doing being YouTube. I mean, I get, you wouldn't believe how much criticism you get. Oh, I can't you imagine. Know, comments. I mean, I have somebody that's their full-time job to get them, get rid of them so that I don't have to see them because I'm sensitive. But I think that that can be really hard for people because uh, for example, there's a comment from uh, Diana who's, who's watching live, who says, I've been made fun of for feeling sad how livestock is treated and often met with, they should be treated that way for our food. Yeah. I, I think yeah, people, a lot of people just don't have sensitivity towards animals. And that's why I think, you know, like laws have to change because you can't change people, but, you know, you can change laws. Yeah, well, I think, you know, sometimes those types of reactions aren't even because people don't care, but because you've touched on something that they do care about and they didn't realize. So you sort of touched a nerve, but they need to react to that and reject it so that they don't have to deal and process with that with those feelings. Because if you said, well, you know, this is what happens. This is what happens to cows. This is how, you know, milk is made. And they just had a cheeseburger. It, you know, they're like, oh, and, and so they need to reject that. And so they need to, they need to put that on you. I have found um, that 
especially online, that people will be a lot nastier than they are in in face to face. Um, I think uh, there's a lot more. Um, you can find a lot more common ground there, but I also tend to reframe if I if I'm in some kind of discussion about animals or somebody comes up to me and says, oh, blah, blah, blah. They ask whatever question about veganism. I say, OK, very good. Um, I, I'll be happy to answer that question, but let me take a step back and I, I'll be happy to answer a question if you let me take a step back and start from the beginning and let me tell you what's veganism, what it means, why, you know, and I have a, a, a 30 second pitch sort of thing and, and um, and the basic of it. And then after that, I'll be happy to answer your question. Is that okay? If they say yes, that's okay. Then you get them the buy-in to have this conversation with you. If they don't, then they don't really want to have a conversation with you. They just want to pick at you. And those conversations I don't want to have. So often I'll just walk away. I'll be like, okay, that's fine. Um, I don't have to answer this question. I don't have to have uh, I don't have to engage with you. And I think that's really important to remember as women in particular. We're often, as you, you said, people pleasing and caring and so on. We're, we're sort of put in these situations where we feel we have to answer or we, we feel not answering is impolite. But really, sometimes answering or engaging in that, we end up getting a lot of grief. And we should say no. We should say, you know what? No, I, I, I'm I'm not up to having this conversation today. Happy to have it another time. Or if it's over dinner, I'm happy to have this conversation after we have dinner and we've all eaten. It'll be much easier, much more pleasant. Can we do that? So, you know, and but that takes a little bit of practice too, because that's not how we are socialized. Yeah, I, and. I yeah, I think people are just different, you know, like, uh, for yeah. example, Mona who's watching live says, I'm very comfortable in my veganism, even when I eat out with non-vegans. Yeah, no, oh, totally. Yeah, um, it, exactly. I mean, you, you know, you have a variety of different experiences. Yeah. And, well, um, you know, Carrie's saying, I think it's timing when someone is already open and explicit comment can be what makes the difference. But if someone is unready, it can actually harden them. I remember hearing a, a a yeah. podcast recently with Jane Velez Mitchell, who said it was Howard Lyman wagging his finger in her face when she was having dairy and he went liquid meat that actually made her go from vegan to from vegetarian to vegan. But I think other people might be put off. And so you, you kind of have to just like in stand up comedy, which I perform, you kind of have to know your audience. You do. You absolutely. I agree with you 100 percent. You got to know your audience. You got to know yourself, where you're at on, on that day and how you're feeling. And, um, you know, and with with Howard, the, the Howard Lyman anecdote, you just said this person was listening to Howard Lyman already. So she was kind of primed, not maybe consciously to what the interaction was going to be like, um, but certainly primed to hear the message or curious about it. I think curiosity is really important. I think if you find people who are curious about learning new things. You can find people who are also interested in change. Yeah. Uh, Linda, who is uh, the premier ethical vegan queen of Sacramento veganism, is saying oh, she'd love to meet you, by the way. She's a, a true ethical vegan with a big heart. And she says, I'm so distraught over what is happening to animals. I have a great daily desire to get on our rooftop and just start screaming and telling everyone to stop killing and eating animals. I guess it's not a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you got to do you. I, I know that's trite. But if uh, ultimately, if that's what you feel you need to do, I mean, maybe not on the roof that you could get hurt, <laughs> literally, but channel that somehow. And if it's having conversations with, I don't know, I've had random conversations, even like on the bus once. Um, I've had conversations with somebody sitting next to me and I was like, oh, I had something in my hand that they saw and they're like, oh, what's that or something, which is unusual for people on the bus to talk to you here. Um, and I had a conversation with them and they're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. 
So random conversations, and if you can do something organized and that's something that you want to do, then channel your energy that way. But I can understand that. I totally get it. It's extremely frustrating and extremely uh, frustrating isn't even the word. Um, there's a lot of anguish. Yeah. Well, a lot of people like to quote the Bible. <laughs> yes. As, as a reason for eating meat. I, I mean, I, 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 you could probably use the Bible to, as a reason to not eat it as well, you know? Exactly. The, the, you can use it for a lot of different things. And, and the Bible has been used to twist truths um, and, and people purposely misinterpret things or misquote. Um, you know, I think that, um, y- you know, and generally it's not people who have gone to seminary school or divinity school and l- actually read everything a million times over. So I, I don't think that's a really, uh, that's a really strong argument. Um, and when people are uh, trying are doing that, they often try to do that to as a gotcha. But there's also nowhere, certainly not in a Christian tradition that's a, or actually in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition in general, that says you have to eat meat or, or you have to drink milk, like that there's nowhere that says that. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that that is like a str- the strongest argument that somebody could come up with. Yeah. But still, you know, people will use it to support or deny whatever it is that they're trying to support or deny. Cindy says, are conversations about veganism easier to have with Canadians versus Americans? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I, 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 our convers- you know, I have had conversations about veganism with people all over the world. And whenever I've traveled and, and the strangest places and people are curious. And if you speak to them with respect and, and um, heart, people will listen again, if they change their minds in a different story that you don't have control over, but they will listen. If you just talk to them, like you would want to ha- have been talked to before you were vegan. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting because I came vegan so young, like no one ever. Well, actually, you know, somebody did say something to me and I'll, I, I remember it. It's a comment that it just, it, it, I mean, it wasn't like mean or anything. It was actually a veterinarian. And she said, you love your dog so much. How can you eat that cow? Like she didn't say it like mean or judgy. She, it was a statement. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, you're right. But, but again, I think a person has to they, you know, they got to want to do it too. You know, they yeah. can't just do it because yeah. you tell them they're bad or wrong or they should for their health. It, it, I don't think it works if you just yeah. tell them what they should do. No, I, I agree. You you can you can give people information and then they need to take it and go home with it. You know, um, but yeah, but amazing the you know to have a vet say that to you. And, yeah, well, she, and she was vegan, so that's why. Yeah, yeah. And a vegan vet. That is yeah. amazing. Uh, isn't that great? Yeah, that 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 is so interesting to me. I knew this veterinarian once who was actually a hunter, and like he would like he would like get paid money to like operate on a deer that broke their leg, and then go out and shoot a different one. Uh, that's the other thing. Like, well, yeah, don't get me started on hunting. I hear you. Yep. Let's see. I'm looking. Read the comments. He, you know, Diana says, "Well, how do you approach the topic of veganism without touching that nerve, or how to present options of what could be eaten instead?" besides soy? Um, Well, when I'm talking about, um, like after I've talked about fairness and after I've talked about sentience and that sort of thing, um, uh, basically one of the things that I always try to, to also talk about is this idea that protein only, well, first of all, that we need as much protein as everyone seems to think that we do. Like that's the only thing we need to eat. And it's like, well, protein is actually a building block of life. A blade of grass has protein. It's different quantities and the, end, everything contains protein to a varying degree. So I said, I usually talk about, um, There's lots of different things that contain protein if that's your concern. But if you eat a varied uh, diet, you will get plenty of nutrients. And um, 
at any point at any stage of life. And if they're concerned about that, I always point to all the various um, medical organizations in the US, in Canada, in Australia, in the UK. Um, I'm trying to think, I've list, I list them all out in the book. I have like a page and a half with all like the actual blurbs from each one that says like at any, basically at any stage in life, you can be vegan. And the thing is, you know, if people are concerned, I said, look, you know, you health is a complex thing. You can certainly be healthy if you're not vegan and you can certainly be healthy if you're not vegan, if you are vegan. So health can go either way in any situation. You can be unhealthy and be vegan. You can be unhealthy and be non-vegan and all of those things. But in terms of food, there's lots of different foods. There's lots of different beans. We have so many beans. If you go to any supermarket, go to the bean aisle, you will see cans, you will see dried goods, so much. We have, you know, yet we always choose to eat those little specific things. I think a lot of people don't go vegan just because they feel it's just not easy. They, you yes. know, if, 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 if you had, like, I remember when I lived in LA, it, it's not there anymore, but there was a corner in Pasadena, California, which had four drive through fast food restaurants. Three of them were, I think it was McDonald's, KFC, and one of the others. And then mm. one was a place called Orion's Health Express. And what that was, was a vegan fast food drive through It wasn't necessarily like the most healthy, you know, of vegan food. However, you know, you could get fries and chili and shakes and really familiar, delicious food, but that's not available to a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? And, and yeah. It's just easier to just do, you know, keep doing what they've been doing. And, and I think that when people are exposed to the, like, we, we had like 16 people over for dinner. We did our Thanksgiving yesterday, long story, but we did it. And, and I, I believe everybody was vegan. One of the people might've been just vegetarian. I'm not sure, but, but the food was like so delicious and everyone was saying, boy, if people could taste this, they would go vegan. You know, I mean, it, yeah. was, it was just, I don't usually pull out, pull out all the stops like that, but it was really like, I even Pressed myself how good the meat was <laughs> because it really, I mean, it really was still, you know, usually I had very simply rice and vegetables. I, you know, I don't make all the, the fanfare, but, but I think that I think a lot of people just aren't exposed to it, you know? It's true. And I think they make more out of it in their minds just because they think that it's going to be so different. So whenever I have conversations with people, one of the things that I say is, you know, and I tell them about the simple stuff that I eat. Like I don't go spending hours and hours in the kitchen every day. You know, I have a bowl that has different has beans. It has some sort yeah. of tell us what carbohydrate. you eat. Everybody loves to know what the oh my gosh. It it depends. If I'm really busy, I'm just basically running around grabbing whatever it is. It, that's you know, rice cakes, bananas, clementines, and I'll have like tofu. That's if I'm busy. If I have a little bit more time, I will have a bowl with a variety of different things. So there will be some sort of grain, um, or even quinoa, which isn't a grain; it's a seed, but I use that as the grain. Um, then I'll have some sort of beans, some sort of uh, a variety of different vegetables, and then I put a you know a dressing, a, some kind of dressing on it to flavor things up. And that's that's really it. I mean, it doesn't have to be a big production, like you said. You know, you you can't possibly pull out all the stops all the time. And if you can, fantastic. And if you have that inclination and that kind of time, terrific. But sometimes it's really like, okay, a bunch of veg vegetables, a bunch of beans, some carbohydrates, and then some tasty stuff on top. And whether that tasty stuff can even just be, you know, a bit of lemon and tahini, and you're good to go. And like, that's really the most basic that 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 we get. What's the vegan scene like in London where you live? Off the charts, I gotta say. <laughs> I, am, I mean, it has changed a lot in these in these ten years. Um, I, there's there's vegan restaurants all over the place, and there's all different kinds. There's fast food, so you can get vegan burgers pretty much everywhere now, in non-vegan places and in vegan places. Um, Non-vegan restaurants, now it's pretty much the norm that there will always be a vegan option. 
It is very rare to go to a restaurant and that has no vegan options whatsoever, but also just the proliferation of vegan restaurants in London. Oh my gosh, it's unbelievable. This is, there's some, I, the number is, is well above the hundreds. It's incredible, but that, also I've not had any problem in, in other places in the UK as well. It's always been pretty good. Are most of your friends and family vegan or do you socialize with the others? <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, um, so my husband is vegan. I have lots of vegan friends uh, and I also have non-vegan friends. Um, uh, usually when we go out, I try to always go to a vegan place. Um, always steer the conversation in that direction if I'm with non-vegans and people seem pretty happy to oblige. Do you give copies of your book to all your non-vegan friends? <laughs> I, you know, only if they've asked. Um, I, I have to say my friends have been extremely supportive. So um, I'm very grateful for that. And and lots of my non-vegan friends um, have bought the book. So um, that's great. And, and have listened to the podcast as well. So again, I'm absolutely grateful for that. That's wonderful. Let's see if there's any... Oh, here's, I saw a question, uh, but I'm, I'm, where did it go? It was about potatoes eating. Oh, here it is from Melody. What do I say in a caring way to my non-vegan sister when she says that starch, such as sweet potato, is too heavy on her stomach? <laughs> what do you say to that? You just say, well, eat, eat a different it depends starch. What, yeah, yeah eat a different starch. Or, or, or actually, I find out what else she's eating during the day that might make her feel that way? Because if she's eating just sweet potatoes, there's zero chance. I mean, that meat that's is heavy. so much more heavier and hard to digest than, than sweet potatoes. So I'd tell her to see a GI doctor, but see, I'm yeah. not, a, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't have the same uh, sense well, of passion for, uh, for people that other people do. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I hear you. No, I mean, if it gets that nitty gritty in terms of nutrition, just say, oh, sorry, I'm not a nutritionist. Um, you know, because is that person really interested in having a conversation? Ask yourself that and just say, hmm, that's so strange that a sweet potato would do that to you. What else are you eating? Or what are you eating with the sweet potato? Have you cooked it enough? Yeah. Yeah. Because Carrie's saying sweet potatoes are like one of the first foods babies get. It's one of the most digestible foods and one of the least. I mean, it's very rare for people to actually be allergic to sweet potatoes. So precisely. Precisely. Yeah. That's exactly when, when, when she said sweet potato, I was like, that can't be. Yeah. <laughs> when people want to do something, they'll find a way when they don't, they'll always find an excuse. Precisely. And, yeah. Interesting. Well, uh, tell us how often do you drop your podcast if people want to subscribe to it? So the podcast, uh, the first season is completed and that's available on all streaming uh, platforms. And the second season will, I'll be recording that in March of next year. And then it'll be in 2023, which is around the corner. Um, and then that will be out uh, April, May, and then once a week. And it'll probably be eight or nine uh, episodes to that as well. And the book is also available on audiobook on all the audiobook platforms and it's on ebook and all of those things. Yeah, I posted the link to both the oh, brilliant. And to Amazon in the show notes. You know, you're also involved in something called a rewilding project. What is that? So yes, we are re involved in a rewilding project and that's basically um, attempting to return the land to a more um, functioning ecosystem um, than what it is now. And it's the uh, the project is in Scotland. It's 100 acres in the um, highlands of Scotland, south of Loch Ness. And it was a small commercial uh, forestry with lots of non-native species of pine trees, like Sitka spruce in particular. And we are replanting uh, with native species and are looking into um, perhaps reintroducing uh, different species of animals who would have lived there and certainly reintroducing different vegetation that would have been there or at least letting nature, uh, well, do its thing. It, when you stop, when you stop managing land, um, 
nature will take over and 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 you'll see all sorts of uh, all sorts of natural uh, regrowth and natural regeneration. So we have lots of different trees also on the site. So we are it's tricky to know what to plant and what not to plant because um, you don't want to be too um, interventionist. Uh, and um, so it, it's a bit of a, a, a delicate dance. And the project uh, is called Birchfield, and you can find that on uh, birchfieldhighlands.org. Thank you. You also have a blog, and I was looking at it, and you had a recipe for something. I loved the sound of it, strofoli. I never heard about it, but, but <sighs> yes, really, yeah. It, I mean, it does. It has ingredients I wouldn't eat, but one of your recipes, which I would eat, is something called a butternut squash spread, and that looked fantastic. Oh my gosh, that spread is so popular with my friends. <laughs> Everybody loves it. It is so good and it's so easy and you can tweak it in lots of different ways um, so that to tailor it to your to your taste. But butternut squash, it's such a versatile uh, vegetable. Yeah, I mean, it's it almost sounds like a, a bean-free hummus. It looks, it looks delicious. Yeah. I never would have thought of you. I'm, I'm going to post the recipe because it looks so good. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you like that. Yeah, and struffoli is a um, is an Italian, uh, um, southern Italian Christmas um, treat. So it's these little balls that can be fried, although I've put them in the air fryer. So little tiny dough balls and um, covered in, in vegan honey. Yeah, yeah. Sprinkles. Now, what, what is vegan honey? Is it is a specific brand or because I there used to be something called bee free honey and, and then I, it, I think it went out of business. Yeah, yeah, they closed a number of years ago in the U.S. I don't know what the brands are in the U.S., um, although uh, there's lots of different bee-free honeys in, in the U.K., lots of different brands. They are, they're made from, um, sometimes it's apple syrup, sometimes it's dandelion, uh, sometimes it's a variety of mixtures. I've also been extremely fortunate uh, when I had my uh, book launch party in New York City this past summer. Um, the uh, folks from Melly Bio were at the party. And that is a, basically, I don't know how it's done. I don't know the science behind it, but basically it's honey that's made in a lab without bees. Well, that's cool. Why don't they start doing that with all animals? You know, I mean, I, I think that yes. could be such a great answer. I am such, I am so for lab grown meat. Even if there's one animal, you know, animal zero, I don't care because think about it, how it's going to help. You know, because people aren't going to stop eating meat in my lifetime or maybe any lifetime. I think that would be just the coolest thing. If they can grow honey in a lab, why can't they do everything else? There's so many things. It's it's hard to wrap my mind around all the various things and what it all means and how it's all made, because it's really uh, it's another level. Yeah. Oh, Angela says she knows Strafoli. She says it's like Italian crack for her. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I I agree. <laughs> yeah, and you did a panettone review on your a vegan panettone review on your blog. That was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Every year I I get together a bunch of vegan panettone that I can find in the UK. And this year there were eight, eight or nine, whatever it was, which is I it's I can't even believe that. It's just incredible. Sure if I've ever even had panettone non-vegan. It's it's like a holiday bread. It's a Yes, it's a, it's an Italian Christmas treat, um, and it comes in a big box, and it's it's leavened. It's generally like a sourdough, um, but it's it's very much. Uh, I've actually made it from scratch, and it, it takes lots of different shortening. To you fold it in, it's and it has uh, dried sultanas, raisins, and um, candied peel. And, and it's delicious. Trader Joe's. That's so funny that Sultana, that's the name of my doctor at True North. His name is Sultana. <laughs> I think that's so funny. I should call him Dr. <laughs> Raisin. You know, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? Because you look so young to me, like you're in your 20s. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of, of uh, being online. I am, uh, let's see, I am 52 years old. No way. Okay. I'm no way. sorry. Okay. I would have believed, you know, 30s, maybe that. No. I would, I'm glad I asked and I'm glad you answered. I, <laughs> that just shows what, it, uh, you know, I always thought like, oh, what's this vegan skin thing? I don't, I don't know. But you know what? I mean, again, aging is all part of our genetics and all part environment, so many things. 
but there it definitely is something to vegan skin. It, oh, and I, I believe, I believe, you know, that, genetics, uh, genetics slows the gun, but our diet really does pull the trigger. Uh, wow. I am blown away. Yeah. I'm so glad I asked that. You, <laughs> you, I, mean, I don't, I usually ask you before if there's anything you don't want to ask, but thank you so much. No, it's fine. I would I, I you, and you, you can't see my gray hair uh, you, in, the, in this light, but I have that. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, I, okay. So a nice comment from Susanna. Emmy is such a champion for the animals. So approachable and so kind. She must be good Aww. at festivals when talking to non-vegans, not threat, non-threatening and not intimidating. And as Susanna said, she really enjoyed the conversation. And so oh, thank you. I. Oh, what are you going to be having for Thanksgiving? Stephanie uh, wants to know, but is, is Thanksgiving even a thing in England? I don't know. No, not really. Um, it's just a Thursday. So I, you know, I have done in the past big Thanksgiving kind of things, uh, but you know, it's a Thursday. My husband's at the office and he comes back and I'm not, you know, not doing all a whole yeah, big thing. Today. I did mine yesterday. We're going to go to a yeah. vegan restaurant that's open. So yeah. 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 Jennifer says you are beautiful, natural beauty. Well, this was so much fun getting to know you. That's why I like Zoom better than traveling because I, you know, you, I just am meeting so many more extraordinary people this way. Oh, it's been an absolute delight. Well, thank you. And tell us where people want to get. I, I put the links for your blog. For I've actually put every link in the sh- in the show notes. But like, where do you hang out the most if people want to connect with you? Instagram, definitely connect with me on Instagram. Uh, Emmy's Good Eating. Um, I am definitely much more active on Instagram than any other social platform and absolutely feel free to email me any questions you might have, send me a DM. And if you're in London, please let me know. I'll actually be at uh, VegFest um, this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. I have a talk on each day and I'll be there um, with a table as well. What are your talks called? What are they about? So the The talk on Saturday is um, it's going to be based on the scenarios and um, it's going to be basically like a workshop of uh, going through various vegan scenarios and any questions or situations that people might have from the audience. I want to be able to have that conversation. I'll have a couple of slides to help us out. And then the second talk will be all about the rewilding project with lots more detail than than what I've gone into with you. Yeah. Yeah. I always wonder, like, you know, I don't, I don't have kids, but, you know, I've heard of kids that, that are vegan, they sometimes get teased. And I wonder, like, do you have an answer for how to handle that? That is tough. Um, That is tough. I'm very fortunate. I don't have kids either. Um, And that is a, but I am fortunate to know lots of people who have had babies in this last decade, and they're all vegan babies and they are amazing and they're the cutest babies in the entire world obviously and um it's it's tough but you know what you handle it the same way we would handle any other teasing you know and any other um fairness issue that come that would come up you just have to equip them with the best possible learning that you can before they're off trying to make their way in life um just like any other question, because veganism really would be like, in in terms of answering any other question, whether it's feminism or anything else that has to do with fairness. Nice. So, well, thank you so much. It's just been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Likewise, it's been absolutely delightful. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Laura Armitage. She's been on the show before. She lost 100 pounds following my ultimate weight loss program in her 70s. And she's going to be making a recipe for Thanksgiving that will blow your mind. Take care.